I'm delighted Charles Jenks and Rem Koolhaas can be with me here today in my RBA office and it's a great opportunity to talk to you before you give your lecture mm. and congratulations mm. on your wonderful award, the Charles Jenks Award 2012. Um, Charles, um, the Jenks Award has for many years celebrated some wonderful architects who have got theory and practice as the common theme like Saha did, Charles Correa and Stephen Hall. What was the jury looking for this year? What was special about this year? We have a view that theory includes uh, a lot of things more than scientific theory. That is drawing, modeling, uh, conceptual thinking, conceptual architecture, um, polemicizing, utopianism, any number of things. And uh, as I'll be saying tonight, our theory is that our brains are multitasking like a Swiss army knife and they have all these modes. And the most creative people use like a Swiss army knife, you know, seven or eight different modules. And theory has to do with the other six. Uh, architecture is one of them. Mm -hmm. Oh, very interesting. Um, Rem, few people embody the theory and the practice like you have as kind of two separate areas. So what lessons has your practice learned from having these two separate offices, OMA, um, they are not really so separate, uh, they, they act as a single entity and um, I find lessons uh, a little bit uh, kind of pompous because basically we, we created the AMO because we had to. Uh, the life of an architect and, and particularly the uh, incredible diversity of context that we have to operate in is so complex at this moment that without uh, some kind of entity that, that can explore before we jump, because that is the key of what we're doing. They really explore the situation that eventually we will uh, find ourselves uh, confronting. So that, that is the, the reason and, and, and that is why, why it existed and why it has been very useful. Mm. Now, um, you've recently, of course, designed the, um, the Gart Naval um, centre in Glasgow, the Maggie Centre, which is a wonderful, wonderful project and on the Stirling shortlist. What was your inspiration behind that? Uh, I find it's always, uh, I may have to make a confession that uh, the word inspiration uh, makes me nervous. Okay. Uh, and, and, and that kind of very often uh, the trigger to what we do comes from a series of negative considerations. Uh, and there we were confronted with a kind of very bleak uh, Scottish uh, medical environment, uh, almost a medical factory. Uh, and basically what we did with uh, Lily is simply explore the, the territory for the slightest uh, hint of uh, another condition. And, and we found a little, little uh, piece of uh, lost uh, trees and, and somehow that became the kind of beginning of uh, something that we could exploit and w which we mm. then kind of built everything around. Very much with nature. Yeah, nature. very much with nature but, but uh, it really it, it was like uh, cloning a tiny piece of nature into kind of something larger. How do you feel that the people react, the people that are actually there for respite? Well, as Ram has just said, it's uh, down in the woods and surrounded by white trees, a lot of <coughs> birch and other uh, garden things. And it's got a hole in the center of it. So the garden is both surrounding it and in the center of it. And they say, when you're faced with a threat, take your pain to nature. So in a sense, Rem has, unlike most architects, put his head below the tree line, hidden himself in the woods mm -hmm. and created the woodscape around him and celebrated that. And it's wonderful for patients who come in. You know, mm -hmm. patients are suffering from a great trauma when they've got a diagnosis of cancer, they're fighting for their life. And the building has to give them all sorts of different things and confidence and risk taking and a sense of being uh, supported in their loss uh, of, of confidence. You know, mm -hmm. when you've got cancer, you lose confidence in yourself. Yeah, of course. And this building rebuilds it in a way. Mm -hmm for them and the carers. I think they're absolutely wonderful. All of Thank them, they're mm. absolutely mm. wonderful, wonderful buildings. Mm. And they've been going for 16 years now. Mm -hmm. So do you both feel that the original precept that exceptional architecture can make people feel better in troubled times of their lives, that this has been proven? 
Well, it's a very complicated question you, you raise, and I, as REM was in the 60s at the AA, we were against architectural determinism. So we were against the idea that architecture can change uh, your behavior and my mm. behavior mm. directly. Mm. Through Maggie's centers, I've changed my mm. mind in mm. a way. Yeah. It can change things indirectly, and it supports. Mm. You, you see, <laughs> I argued with a doctor about this who said, if it's a bad building, we don't show up for work. I hadn't mm. thought of that. Mm. I hadn't thought, you can prove the negative. Bad mm. buildings do hurt society. Mm. It doesn't prove that good buildings can change it positively, but we found that it supports the carers first. And if you care for the carers, the carers care for the patients. And that was a kind of virtuous circle. And in that way, it does indirectly. Good architecture is an incredible support for an institution. I think the beauty uh, of these uh, buildings is, is that they're small. And I think that this is really the key. Uh, because in a small building you can do things that uh, even today you cannot do in a kind of bigger building. And, and for that reason I think it's not so much that there are kind of exceptional buildings, but it's become an exception to do small buildings. Uh, and I think uh, if we had more small buildings in whatever category, uh, mm. the world in many ways uh, would be a bigger place. The whole category of smallness has been uh, miserably neglected, I would say. Mm. Yeah. Um, How very Dutch of you. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah, super Dutch. <laughs> um, you finally built in the city of London with an elegant tower. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel that New Court engages with our city in London? Well, I think it's really made by your city in the sense that uh, your city is a kind of glorious mess. Uh, and, and this uh, particular point uh, is so dense and, and so opaque uh, that uh, it's kind of really the essence of the city. And so it was uh, kind of really wonderful to, to be able to, to intervene in that. Uh, and intervene is maybe even too active a word. Uh, I was really dictated by it. I took the city almost as a kind of, uh, as a mold and, and cast some matter into it and, and that's what the building is. So it's entirely defined by the city. Mm. You opened it out, so yeah. you, you, mm -hmm. it's very porous, like mm -hmm. Swiss cheese. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it comes apart. Um, your architecture always seems to have been a search for a new kind of modernism, one that reinvents the way we use cities, rather than giving us an ar architectural masterpieces. So it's important to look at cities as they are, rather than the utopian way they might be. Well. I think I have uh, relative um, mixed feelings about architecture. And I think that having mixed feelings has been kind of very productive in a way because I, I, I bo both cultivate hesitation and, and also cultivate creation in a certain way. So I think the two are connected like communicating vases. Uh, and for that reason, uh, it is true that I need a kind of persistent engagement with the city as it is to, I guess, in, in order to also be able to define how it could change uh, in, in, in very, very small doses. Mm. Uh, and finally, um, wh where do you think we're going? I mean, where do you think that the future of the modern city is, rather than doing the same old, same old? Where do you think the city is going so that we don't have this big divide of rich and poor and that we have an integrated design for our cities? Do you have a theory? Yeah, I think the city is uh, an economic institution and uh, the economy is going crazy in both opposite directions. People are fed up with that. Mm. Um, and we're trying to renegotiate our, our whole social contract. So and having trouble doing it, after all. Mm. 2007 was how many years ago? Five years ago, not mm. one banker's mm. gone to jail. Mm. Uh, it's unthinkable yeah. that it, yeah. you know, this is post-depression. On the other hand, uh, you know, one should spare some feelings for the people trying to lead the countries. I mean, Obama and Cameron have almost less power than architects in, in ha helping society, and they have got to get reelected. Mm. You know, the Germans fam famously said, we know what to do, we don't know how to get reelected if we do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's a, it, we, we're facing this one-off uh, mega, mega crisis, and it's urbanistic. You know, uh, Jacob Rothschild came out in favor of Occupy Wall Street. Mm. 
yeah. when that starts happening. Yeah. That's, that's a warp. That's yeah. cultural warp. Now, I, I don't, the city, obviously, what's going to happen is as usual, it's going to go in many directions. And, uh, you know, there is not one model. If, if we've learned one thing from the 70s and 80s is that every city is like every other person, has its character, its growth, its personality, its decline, its rebound. And we can't prescribe, I think, we, no one would anymore, mm. one model for the global situation, mm. although globalized cities may start looking like each other. I think that's one of the problems, that, that a lot of people think that the identical city is yeah. the way to go copy what's been done before. But Rem, you probably mm. would think that that's... that's well, I, I, I want to mention to us uh, a little bit. Uh, I just come from Doha. And, and uh, there is absolutely no gloom uh, and also no crisis in Doha. Mm. Uh, and, and that is not simply because there is more money in Doha or fewer problems, but I think it's also because you see here and there uh, emerging kind of really interesting new ways of maybe consider politics or consider society. Uh, and uh, therefore, I think Charles is right that the answer has to be found in politics. Uh, but the crisis you describe, I think, is a crisis of, of the West more than uh, a crisis everywhere else. Mm. I think there are problems everywhere else, but... Mm. So well, I hope you're right. The other thing, uh, I'm personally, I'm always incredibly bad in predicting the future, but um, I'm talking tonight about some intentions uh, that I have and one of them in, in which I'm kind of investing a lot of uh, time is to to look not necessarily at cities but to look at the countryside yeah. because it's really weird that 98% of the world is countryside or <laughs> at least is non-city yeah. and we've been totally obsessed with the city and, and neglecting everything else and um, I'm sure that sooner or later we will discover that some relationship between the two and probably also some... Can I make a comment yeah? on that? Ram always reminds me of this investor, Warren Buffett. Now Warren Buffett has a theory that if everybody's The richest man X, of the world. Which, yeah, 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 he's also the second yeah. richest man in the world. But, you know, going counter market and uh, for Rem to discover the countryside, that's my place. Uh, um, it's wonderful. Yeah. I mean, you know, but it's a very interesting take on mm. on a thinking outside the box and thinking outside where our thoughts are. And I think that that he's right because if eighty percent of the world is urbanized, it actually it means the country is changing radically. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's very uh, interesting. unbelievably fast. Yeah. Unbelievable. Well, let's watch this space. Thank you both okay. very much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.